Ladies and gentlemen, hi there, and welcome to our special program of the Chinese Lunar New Year. I'm Yang Rai. Happy Chinese New Year, by the way. Once again, it's the time of the year when people gather together, and that gives us a greater opportunity to embrace the Chinese culture around us. We've been talking a lot about the soft power in the past year. Today, we're going to continue our cultural discussion, this time looking at the Chinese national dress. As a nation rich in history and culture, what notions of Chinese dress do we see in either the ancient or recent past? Is there such a thing today? And does China need a particular national dress? Or are individual choices the right answer for today's society? To answer these questions and take the discussion further, I'm so glad to be joined in the first half of our Spring Festival special by Hanhua Media and Communication Consultant. Professor David Moser, Academic Director of Capital Normal University and Yoi Shumazu, former editor of Japan Times. In our second half of the discussion, when we come back, we'll be joined by Jennifer Leung. She is the CEO of Big Golf Education and the Vice President of LC Venture. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Hey, gentlemen, the universal question for the Chinese today about the dress code is whether we should have a national dress. Han Huang? What should be a national dress? In my opinion, it should be a combination of tradition Chinese, traditional Chinese dress and the modern elements. The traditional uh, Chinese dress usually include some natural materials like the silk, like the, the linen, like the wool, like the cotton, and also with some very Chinese features like the embroidery. And the modern elements could probably inc include like a little bit big sleeves for your work to, to work easily, to move easily, to, to have more flexibility. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid this issue has been seriously, if not brutally, ignored most of the time by the Chinese, unless and until we have an occasion like the APEC summit in Beijing or in another host country where all the participants, leaders of the countries they represent, are required to put on the local dress. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. In our case, it's the Tang Zhuang, the Tang mm -hmm. dress. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, in this case uh, we have to think very carefully about the issue of a uh, national dress? Because it seems Tang Zhuang symbolizes uh, our traditional dress code. The problem with that is the Tang Zhuang is, has not uh, kept up a parallel usage with the Western suit. So it's still seen as a special traditional costume, something from, from past times, almost, almost like a, a Halloween costume. It's not, this is not something you would wear in daily life. And so to, for everyone to put it, put it on, does, it doesn't, doesn't symbolize sort of a unity with that culture. It, it, it symbolizes dress up day and it's like a costume party or something like that for fun we're going to put on the same clothes for fun but then when we get through we all put back our, our western suits mm -hmm. so I mean I think that's probably the problem with it it's not so much as nationalistic as it's hearkening back to a time that's an old time I, I agree with Helen that I love this kind of <laughs> oh, this more flexible open broader space more space filled uh, dress style because it's more comfortable it's more natural you feel more at and ease. And it carries the overtones of the Belt and Road Initiative with the silk, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And do you have, a, uh, do you have yeah. any public debates about whether Japan should have its own national dress? Well, I think, uh, you know, Japan is the most westernized of the Asian countries. So, and we are also a very conformist uh, industrial society. So, of course, I'm the only one here with a blue suit, okay? <laughs> Typically, Japan Japanese. Japan started to be the most western since the Meiji Restoration period. Yeah, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. And then you started the process of industrialization mm -hmm. by, first of all, how, by, first of all, improving how to look better and how to look not like Asian, but you look more European, right? That, well, that is. I think that's a grand self-deception we got into. But younger people in Japan are rebelling. There's a lot of emphasis now on artisanship, dropping out of the corporation, starting your own business. And they're wearing Japanese carpenter clothes with very wide jodhpur like pants, like horse riding pants, used by carpenters, uh, growing their hair longer. And so they're moving away from this whole hip hop business into an older tradition. And that's very rebellious in Japan. So they're kind of uh, tough guys, <laughs> young guys are pretty tough. So, you know, if you're going to wear long hair in Japan, you've got to be tough. 
<laughs> Helen, what should it look like today? Should mm -hmm. we pick one of our traditional dresses or look for a new one which incorporates both our tradition and the modern elements? Yes, so like what I just said, actually the APEC dress or suit is not a traditional Tang Zhuang, it's a combination already. It's, it is called from the APEC chief designer, um, Ms. Chu Yan, it is called a new or an updated Tang Zhuang from the Tang Dynasty. She and her team definitely introduced some of the key elements of Tang Zhuang into the new modern era, which combined the old patterns like the sea and the waves pattern, but also include the natural color or the, the current modern color into this fashion and also the flexibility into the whole dress suit, so which makes people feel uh, easily to be adapted to this kind of new dress. So I think if we are going to, we are not definitely in, not in urgent need to have a unified national dress, but if we are going to move that direction, that could be a consideration to have something in combination. What do you think of the image of our first lady, Peng Ma Ma, who might have combined both elegance with the fashion in her own dress on formal occasions. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because uh, she, being a woman, is able to apply some degree of flexibility with mm -hmm. her attire that her husband can't. Because when you're stuck with a suit, it's a suit. There's very little you can do with it. You can't add a Chinese collar or a, a, some kind a of scarf. A, 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 yeah, a yeah. scarf or something like that. It's a suit. George Armani tried to inject something into the Western suits, the very formal one. It failed for some reason. <laughs> I, think, I think because suits are associated too much with, with business. But there are many formal occasions that aren't business occasions. There's mm -hmm. political uh, formality, there's party formality, there's all sorts of things. But there's this, this sort of idea that a man's suit can only be this rigidly defined sort of pattern. When, when, I, when my wife takes me to go buy a suit, I think, just pick one at random, they're all the same. There's, there's very little difference between one suit and another. But whereas Peng Yuan is able to take something that has a sort of a, a Western look, but she can add a Chinese look to it because she has many different degrees of flexibility. Men don't have that. If, if it's either a suit or something else. And I think maybe that needs to change. Maybe, I don't know if Georgie Armani can do it. I'm so happy that we discussed about First Lady and I want to continue that. I'm happy that she tried different styles. Sometimes it's very Western, very modern. Sometimes it's a balanced tone with you know, the modern dress, with the Western dress, but with the traditional elements to be added on. And sometimes she just tried the Chi Pao as well, like the APEC dress. It's, it's kind of more traditional than modern. What do you think of the variety of ethnicity? in China, because mm. we have 56 uh, minority nationalities in this country, and uh, perhaps one uh, example during the plenary session of the National People's Congress may enlighten our discussion here. Those participants from the rural, uh, the ethnic areas yes. are required to put on their traditional dress. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of this political overtone or a symbolic implication? Well, that shows the diversity of the country. If not the, the proportion of representation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, it, it's not a vote by numbers. It's what every group, no matter how large or small, has a certain tradition that goes back a while. And it's their form of expression. You know, dress is very much, dress, dance, music are all forms of expression. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we live in a mass society. You know, China, the larger China is a mass society, an industrial society, where people come from all over the country to go to the big cities to work. And so there is a pressure there not to stand out if you're riding a subway mm -hmm. or a bus. You have to be like everyone else. This mm -hmm. is just pressure all over the world like this. How we break with that is very different. Because China, you know, is a very democratic country. It's an egalitarian country. Uh, it's not an elitist society. An elitist society, a man can wear... Yeah, I remember my first dinner jacket was in Kobe, very wealthy place. I had to go to some sort of formal thing. So I said, I'm going to go all the way. So I, got, I had, went to a tailor, and it was a magenta and black, very similar to your pattern. Uh, dinner jacket, and I can get away with it because everyone there was fabulously rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can't do this in your public school. You get beat up. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I, th pressure. I, think one, I think one thing that is lost, if you look at these old photos and, and uh, early movies of, of old Beijing from the 1910s, 1920s, yes. you, see, you see people walking around the street 
and you can identify very often their ethnicity mm. or their class mm. or their job because the, the clothes they wear reflect that. And nowadays it's getting harder and harder, at least for me, to look in the street and tell, you know, where is this person from? And especially in the business world, they all look exactly alike. I, I wonder if that's something, the, the problem I see with, it, with uh, requiring or asking the ethnic minorities to wear their traditional garb, at, uh, you know, for, for the party meetings is because it's artificial. They don't necessarily wear those clothes in daily mm. life anymore mm. either. Mm. Those, are, those belong to another era. Mm. So by, by making them wear those clothes, you're sort of reinforcing a kind of a stereotype. You know, the, this culture now, uh, you know, this culture still wears these kind of clothes, much like in, in the United States, uh, uh, indigenous American, the American Indians or the, the, the Native Americans object to be putting on these Indian outfits because they don't wear those clothes anymore. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is we've lost the tradition, of, uh, we've lost the, 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 the sort of ethnic uh, identity and these particular sorts of styles. We've lost them because of the modern world where everyone sort of adopts mod modernity. Yes. And so if you try to reassert that, it's strange. It looks antiquated or it looks stereotyped, which is even worse. That's the, that's the problem. It's something you have to, you have to re, re, retain from the past or regain from the past. It's, it's long gone. And are you talking about uh, globalization fundamentalists? <laughs> they say, we've got to have a standard of universality. For example, Western suits should be the sole uh, diamond-bearing standard. And uh, that indicates that you are willing and ready to be integrated into the mainstream uh, society, which means Western society. Mm. It's interesting to, to compare the 1920s, 1930s to the current times because at that time, as David mentioned, that the dress code can be identified very easily by profession. So each profession, they have their own dress code, daily life, daily work. But nowadays, it's not that sophisticated. So if we say globalization in this term, that maybe shows a kind of globalization universal language in terms of the dress code. People dress for their business, people dress for their relaxation period. This is just not that sophisticated, only, only maybe two categories. That's kind of, it's not evolution, it's kind of, you know, people are moving, are merging together in terms of using dress or suits as their universal language. Look, we have uh, three situations, gentlemen. One is your profession, the other occasion, and mm -hmm. the third, your daily life. Just be casual, uh, be it the weekend or the, the weekdays mm. from Monday through Friday. You wear whatever you like. However, when you are a banker or a lawyer in mm. the Wall Street, mm. you have to be very formal, mm. right? But uh, if you are like uh, at the opening ceremony of the National People's Congress of the APEC, you have to be very formal. You are watching dialogue with Helen, David, and Yoichi. We are talking about whether China should have its national dress after China has got integrated with the world for almost four decades. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us. Hey, gentlemen, and the beautiful lady. Uh, what do you think of the combination of the fan and the Western suit? Does that deliver any unique message about uh, uh, what China is facing today? <laughs> I would say fusion as the key <laughs> word. And I would say it definitely delivers your confidence in keeping the Chinese tradition, but still make yourself feel more comfortable, more relaxed during the, 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 the shooting. <laughs> I'm wearing a Western suit, but I look Chinese. I am a Chinese. Uh, using a fan doesn't mean I am or go back to only the traditional Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Still, I want to go to Japan to draw inspirations from how you have been successfully uh, going through this uh, trajectory, for example, on very formal occasions, uh, mm -hmm. even in a very unpleasant and nasty place like uh, uh, the Yasukuni Shrine. Mm. The Japanese are wearing their traditional dress, and the mm -hmm. Japanese women look very beautiful mm -hmm. on that occasion. I'm not talking about the political implications, right. but that's a very formal occasion, religious ceremony for mm -hmm. the Jap Japanese to be wearing their own traditional costume. Well, of course, the kimono is seen in Japan as the highest standard of uh, you know, textile and uh, fashion beauty. Uh, men also wear you know, hakama, the pants, and the uh, men's kimono. Uh, but the problem is, is that you know, silk if you wear too much of it, and it tends to, it has to be long mm -hmm. for style reasons. You need a wooden floor to slide along on. It affects oh. how you walk, mm. and laundering it is impossible. 
and folding it and storing it is quite difficult so most people will use that to get married and put it away as a memento and that's it so that's a problem with the traditional style one thing i like to add though what i've noticed because i go to many you know chinese museums and far out places like xian dun wan what i think is the appropriate men's style and we think of that as physicality you know what the clothes you wear is about your body it's about physicality and today most people sit at a computer right. a sedentary job but they'll spend much more three times as much money on their running clothes in their gym outfit and their sneakers than they will on their suit because right. the reminder the historic reminder of our body the strength we had the powers we had when i look at chinese museum i look at as in other societies the cavalry men the men the horse riding military guys and i see their clothes from the Han Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, up to the Manchus. Uh, you know, the buttons coming down like this so they can fire an arrow yes. and a short jacket. I think that's the classic menswear, the best looking, and it really suits the, the Asian man's body, being a little shorter, not as long in the legs, that the shorter top and all that. So I do think that has a future to come back to. And I think everyone imagined themselves to be a samurai or a warrior <laughs> of some sort. And I think that's the fundament of the warrior. That jacket is the fundament of the warrior image. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I think a lot of Chinese men would like to go back to. They love Kung Fu movies, obviously, and these old movies. So we, I, I think that will be appropriated at some time. But you will have to find the Chinese Armani to do it. The, Chinese, mm -hmm. the Armani, he took the priest cassette and made that into the black suit. Yeah, I think that uh, something that we sort of touched upon, but I'll just say it explicitly, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse or conflate modernization with westernization. And they're, they're, or with Americanization. Or with American, <laughs> even worse. With we, don't want, we don't want to be so close to the image of a cowboy uh, well, who examines things in black and white terms. Well, but very few the people... Law, we, will be the only solution, right? Few, people, any wear, conflict. few people wear <laughs> cowboy hats and cowboy outfits while they're on the computer <laughs> at work. Uh, <laughs> but there's a reason mm. ca the, the cowboy outfit, like the samurai, fit the occupation and fit, fit yes. the, the climate mm. of the times. Mm. Here's an example many people have raised, for example, which is... In the hot summer uh, weather and in, in hot arid regions of the, of the world, why should this long sleeve, mm -hmm. um, you know, Western jacket be the be the norm when it actually requires a lot of air conditioning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all sorts of other uh, problems? Why not have a a style, a formal style that involves a sh short sleeves or lo looser clothing, but still says formal? And the only thing standing in the way is just inertia, cultural inertia and, and tradition. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you can't say, well, in summer we switch to this style and that's formal. But if, but if you just, uh, everyone in the office, the only way they've gotten around that now is by an enlightened boss or CEO says, look, a new company policy, it's ridiculous to, for us to be sweating all the time. Mm -hmm. Men can now come in short sleeves mm -hmm. and ties mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, and it's a new rule. That's the only way you can do it. But there needs to be a... a a universal social Yes, movement. indeed, modernization doesn't mean automatically westernization yeah. or Americanization. But yeah. what about our immediate neighbor <coughs> of Japan? Again and again, I, I turn to Japan for inspirations in how to appropriately, mm -hmm. appropriately uh, adopting the colors, yeah. the styles of your dress. Mm. Um, today, when we review the issue of a legacy of history, the yes. legacy of a traditional culture. Yeah. Uh, under what circumstances do you think uh, the issue should be featured more prominently? At a ceremony, in the curriculum or textbooks, or on the very formal occasions, whatever ceremony is, the wedding, the funeral, or a swearing in. So what do you think should be the occasion for uh, yeah, translating the legacy into our daily mm -hmm. life and daily realities. Yeah. We do have now the current occasions like the big ceremonies, national ceremonies like the MPC conferences or the APEC global meetings, all as significant as a wedding ceremony that this kind of dress code needs to be reinforced so that people can on the one hand to be reminded of their, of our uh, legends, our tradition, at the same, uh, uh, on the other hand, to be showing the respect to the, to the audience, to, the, to, to your friends, to the families, to your relatives, the respect as well. Wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this uh, case study, uh, your age. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you think this is a, a religious occasion? Because well, that's uh, a topic I would I try to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> In religious. Uh, you mean I marriage? Mean, marriage or religion? <laughs> no, no. A wedding ceremony tends to embarrass me a lot here in China. For yes. example, people, the first idea that crosses their mind is to have a big dinner, okay? mm. very beautiful food, mm -hmm. yes. instead of uh, being particular about the dress code to show your respect mm -hmm. for the young couple, right? They, food is first and foremost the prioritized thing mm -hmm. for these participants. They give their donation, they pay their own shares. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. I have some beautiful food. Then I leave mm -hmm. without expressing your right. best wishes. Mm. And the solemn wedding vows uh, are the most uh, impressive and touching moments for mm -hmm. me each mm -hmm. time. Be it in the church or in a very formal uh, hall or place. So um, in America or in Europe, mm -hmm. do you think uh, th these are the places where Japan drew its inspirations? Well, no, actually, no, no, in Japan, weddings we wear Shinto costumes, the ch traditional Chinese yeah. mm. kimono, uh, and then also the Western one to for sort of the party afterwards, okay? Uh, funerals, uh, Buddhist robe, yeah, we wear. So the ceremony depends on the tradition that best suits that ceremony. So wedding, I suppose in China would be Confucian, the two families yes. joining and, you know, the, the parents being there. So I think it would be appropriate to develop a more s simplified, sim slimmed out Confucian robe, attire. And then, obviously, the, the funerals, more Buddhist. You want to send the person on to the next life. So, mm. so yeah, there is religion, there is weddings, and there's death. You know, these are the three. The issue is, does the Japanese diet have any legislation which asks the Japanese nationals to be wearing their traditional dress? Well, in Japan, we, in Japan we don't need legislation. We just have tradition that's so... Bound, binding us. Smaller country, you have to understand, China's a huge country, actually a multicultural country, mm. so it's much harder, I think, to bring... Without the coercive uh, implication of the legislation, or without the coercive application of the legislative pieces, you mean the Japanese people have been very sensitive to the details of their life. Well, Psychologically, well, they, they, okay. they respect each other. There is the sort of a seat, uh, underlying uh, uh, s system of order or laws. That's uh, every wedding hall does follow a compliance of the Marriage License Bureau and they issue sort of guidelines yes. on what's appropriate and they will provide the costumes if you don't have your own and so on. So yeah, there is an underlying code enforced mm. by a, in a semi-official government body. And perhaps uh, the dress code has a lot to do with the code of conduct. Do you think, um, uh, for example, on the occasion of a wedding ceremony, at the, uh, on the invitation card you should uh, write clearly, please, you are required to be dressed up mm -hmm. very formally. Do you think this should be a requirement for the Chinese? You know, I sort of see George's point. In China, it's an, if, if, even if you wrote formal dress re, uh, required, mm -hmm. what would that mean? Mm -hmm. It would mean different things to different people, mm -hmm. and it would mean different things to different generations mm -hmm. of people. That's the problem. That, that there be in, the, in, the, in a culture that's, that's, that's got vast generational differences. Mm. I mean, the grandparents of the couple maybe had grew up in the Cultural Revolution where they wore, you know, the blue mouse suits and the, the, what was formal back then. Mm. So uh, well, okay I think, you, too, I think right? we're lacking a common uh, mm. sartorial language here. Mm. That's the problem. But at least the bottom line is that pants or the jeans cannot be in the <laughs> yeah, well, right. right. Yeah. Like, yeah, Let's right. start from the bottom line. <laughs> start from the bottom line. It yeah. cost a thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <Very special. laughs> Maybe Armani style, not as flexible. And of course, you have the exceptions like Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, always mm. wears a T-shirt. Mm. That's his yeah. uniform. You know. So uh, what does right. formal mean to him? Signature. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think I've been jail. talking to elites of the IT industry in China. They say uh, Zuckerberg repre represents uh, elites of this industry by wearing jeans mm. and T-shirt. Mm -hmm. So however hard I try <coughs> to persuade him to be wearing the Western suit, he says, mm. if I were to be wearing the Western suit, I would destroy the appetite of my colleagues in mm. the industry. Oh. <laughs> because they take uh, uh, Zaberg as the uh, god. But he wore the western suit in his wedding ceremony. That's true. Small, mm -hmm. Yes, more mm -hmm. ceremony. Mm -hmm. well, that, yeah. That's the, that's the only yeah, occasion. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. You don't mess with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
it's absolutely unthinkable and even ridiculous mm -hmm. to learn from Japan. During the period of Meiji Restoration, they, have a, they had a, radically, a radical departure from the Asian cultures and they turned to Europe, turned to the West to start industrialization. However, what about the school uniforms? Okay, uh, one or two decades ago, I was so embarrassed by the one-size-fits-all <laughs> school uniform. I was so embarrassed. Not only the, uh, the uniforms got so dirty, uh, <laughs> but the size, well, it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, it's a scandal uh, for the kids, <laughs> for schoolgirls. Mm. I don't know where I should uh, voice my complaints. I mean, this is just uh, uh, a manifestation of uh, embarrassment on a certain stage of our social development. Mm. But today, do you think, uh, when I look at Japanese girls, school girls, when mm. I look at uh, even students in, tai in Taipei, mm. in Bangkok, they are wearing tailored mm. uniforms. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But in China, it's one size fits all. <laughs> yeah. mm. And in terms of administration, it's also rule by decree, right? You stop, whatever yeah. the situation. Yeah. What's wrong with the Chinese culture? I have my own example. It's one of the biggest barriers for my daughter to transfer from a private school to the public, mm -hmm. you know, junior high school, because of the school uniform. Mm -hmm. In the private school, you got to the chance to even to design your school mm -hmm. uniform and to, uh, to at least to, to show some of the participation into the school uniform. And it's definitely tailor-made. It's good material. I think the problem is more like it's population based and the economy based rather than the culture or the taste based. But definitely culture and taste can help reform something. But when she transferred to the public school, it's not that one size fits all situation, but it's the sport, sporty dress, only, only the sporty dress. Uh, only several sizes to be to be selected, <laughs> not uh, mm. the general, the sophisticated uh, class well, categories. Thank you so much for this discussion about the Chinese dress and whether we should have a national dress code. Thank, Thank you. you. And behind that, whether we should have a code of conduct, above all. Mm -hmm. It depends on degree of civilization, mm. but it doesn't mean westernization. Right. Mm. You're politically correct. <laughs> Thank you so much.